lay it out like I'm, you know, don't have an arch done there. Where I'm throwing these, it's like I don't need it to sink at six inches. You know, it's like they're completely weedless, so the, the hook point will ride right behind the head like that. And the hook itself is peeled and weighted on the bottom. We, uh, we typically put them on um, pretty long, like 10, 12 foot uh, leaders on a floating line. Um, don't need it to get much more than six inches in the water um, because it's gonna be climbing up over the structure and stuff like that. Um, what I find is that um, if I'm doing it with an intermediate line or a sinking line, I'm just going to be uh, a, a lot of abrasion on the on the fly line itself. So you know, uh, with the with the floating line and a long leader, one, it's less spooky for like really clear water, uh, and then two, um, every big fish that I'm catching, I'm retying because when you're when you're casting back in those bushes and in the wood and the rock and you're dragging your leader across that stuff, it's gonna abrade. Um, so we, you know, the thinnest that we'll use is like 20 pound fluoro, um, and we're constantly retying, which is another reason why we're using such a long leader is so that we don't have to actually retie the leader uh, much. Um, but you, you can float this, uh, or put this on, uh, sink tips and intermediate tips and you know fish it like you would a regular fly close to structure but not in it um, but uh, the the way that we normally fish it is on a floating line long leader um, that we're constantly retying. Right. I'm Fletcher Sams um, we are going to tie uh, this cool little bass bug um, that we've been throwing around and messing around with for the past couple of years um, it's called a tweaker. Uh, this one's a big one uh, called the XL tweaker, and we're gonna do some fun stuff with it, um, like really dress it up. Um, but what we do with these bugs is uh, they're structure bugs. We, st we fish a lot for uh, shoal bass around here, and those fish really like uh, to hug up against different types of structure, wood, rock, uh, in the middle of current. And if you're gonna spend this much time tying one of these uh, game changer based bugs, you don't want to lose it, and uh, we'll throw these in the trees, in the bushes, up on the bank, um, and elicit those really nasty reaction strikes um, right there, um, coming past them. Uh, it's not a bug that we throw a lot in like deep pools and stuff like that. We have better bugs for that, but uh, you need to fish structure and not get hung up. These are the bugs, and it's really what makes it uh, different than a lot of different bugs is the way that the, the hook and head work together in concert. And the hook itself is kind of weighted to have that hook point, and it's a stinger, kind of bend on that hook. But that hook point rides just below the, the head. And when it floats like that, um, makes it completely weedless. It'll, it'll drag through a lot of wood, uh, definitely over rock, so fish it in pocket water, fish it up against the bank, fish it off of the bank, um, and you'll have big fish climbing over dry, dry branches and stuff, trying to chase that thing down. Um, we do tie them smaller, uh, but uh, for bigger fish, um, the smaller hooks uh, will, will kind of straighten out sometimes. Um, so we went to a, a beefier hook uh, with these big ones and uh, also a little bit different keeling weight. Uh, but these are easier to tie and we catch bigger fish. Uh, the smaller ones are more for like red eye bass, trout, that kind of thing. Um, but the layout of this one um, is a... And, then, and the end bug is going to be about five inch bug. Um, on the smaller ones you can tie them in like crawfish colors and it's a little bit more of a buggy bug. Uh, at this size it's it's a bait fish. Um, so we kind of 
tie it. You can um, tie this, and today we're going to tie it uh, full dressed. So we're going to stack marabou on top of the and bottom of the end to give it a belly and a back uh, color. Um, you can really tie these to match the hatch. This one's a sucker, and you can have like kind of the, the bottom fins uh, match and everything like that. Uh, this one's a, a chub. I, again, I've got the, the bottom area to kind of matching that fin coloration um, and really the sky's the limit with uh, matching the hatch on these bugs. And then for connecting it all together, uh, we're going to use a 15 millimeter shank instead of wire. Um, and we'll keep that off to the side with a hook. Um, and then we'll finish it off with a deer head, uh, deer hair head. Um, the deer hair head very important on these flies. Um, if, if you look at it, it's got a lot of hair above the center line, and we'll, we use that to kill the, the bug uh, more than we do for anything else. So the, the, the deer hair is doing two things. It's acting like a weed guard, and it's also acting like a keel. Um, on the smaller bugs, you don't need to weight the hook uh, because it's a lighter gauge wire, but on uh, these bigger bugs, or, or the thicker gauge hooks that they make, um, you, you do need to keel it. Um, but with this size, 3.8 millimeter bead kills it perfectly. Even though this thing has got a, a good amount of a weight to it, it's, it's got a, a tungsten bead, medium lead eyes, um, it, it does not have a jigging action. It, it's, it suspends, it's a, a swim fly type action. Um, and that helps with the weedlessness because the head will sink slightly slower than the body. Um, and, and kind of move that hook point right in line with the top of that head. Um, so when you're moving it through uh, the aquatic forest, it's going to ride straight through there and not give you any kind of hangups or anything like that. Um, so um, the base of this is uh, kind of a feather game changer. Um, type body, you can tie it uh, without the game changer stuff. Uh, like this is just a guide fly version um, that has the hook head, which is the basis of the fly, and then instead of the game changer tail, it just has a rabbit strip for the tail. Um, does everything exactly the same. Uh, but uh, with uh, feather game changers, um, we have a lot of different options as far as blending the in and um, adding all these colors for realism. Um, but uh, if you are blending with a hen and don't know how to do that, um, these two hen saddles are from the same company, uh, but they have a little bit of different shape uh, to the feathers. Uh, these are more what you would see as a typical feather. These are a lot wider. Um, and so when you're picking out these feathers um, and, and you're wanting to do a blend, I always start with uh, what I think is the uh, the, the, the larger size um, so that when I'm picking them out um, I'm not hunting for um, feathers that are smaller when I get out the second one so what I'll do is I'll go ahead and lay out the feathers on the bigger sized uh, saddle and then overlay it with the blend on this side um, the reason that I lay this out uh, beforehand is I want to make sure that the taper is there um, and it also, by picking out the feathers ahead of time, I'm not going back and hunting uh, for the right feathers as I'm in the middle of the fly. So I do a lot of prep work on these bugs before we actually even pick up the, the bottom and start throw, uh, throwing them together. The, the size of these bugs, when you're, when you're trying to start with your, your smallest feather and you run into a saddle like this, the saddle is really big. Um, there's not a lot of small feathers. That's not a big deal because the support structure in here, the brush that we're going to use to, to build the taper, the, the feathers are going to conform to whatever shape that is. So um, if the feathers are too long, it's just going to have one nice big smooth body instead of kind of a choppy skeletonized body. Um, like this one's a little bit more skeletonized uh, than this one, uh, but uh, they're the same size, same profile. Um, so those are, that's going to be the difference. So I, I kind of like the, the bigger feathers. It gives more of a one smooth body. Um. First thing I'll do is uh, when I'm prepping a feather 
is I'll look for that line where you get kind of this marabou kind of stuff right there. And uh, you get into the webbier feathers and then I'll just grab it and peel it off. Now, um, what I'll do is I'll just go ahead and since we're doing a blend, um, the number of feathers that I want on this bug are um, two, 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 two feathers, three on the hook, and then four on the head. Um, the reason you want to increase the number of feathers as you go up is you're getting a, a larger spread around that brush, and if you if you don't add the feathers, you'll just it'll it'll be a lot sparser in the front than it is in the back, and you just want it to be one you know tapered bug. So you add feathers in the front to give it uh, more of a, that hen body where you're not seeing the brush in between. Um, so what I'll do is I'll pick the smallest feather out of the biggest saddle in the blend, uh, and then I'll work my way up. Um, so what I'll do is just kind of lay out. feathers that I need. As I move up, the feathers are going to get bigger in size, even though they don't look that way, but this is why we do this ahead of time, instead of while we're in the middle of the bag. And then on the hook, I do like to go a little bit larger on that jump, because it is getting a little bit bigger. Uh, and on that Bump, we're doing two feathers of that color and then on the head. So on this fly, the, the shoulders are the thickest part of the, of the bug is, is on the hook and then the head is, is kind of the same size. Um, so you kind of stop the taper on the hook. All right, so now that I've, I've got the feathers that I think that I want. Um, so now that I've kind of picked these feathers off the saddle and I think that they're the right size, um, what I'll go ahead and do is go ahead and strip them. Um, and get them all kind of lined up. Um, the, the, the critical piece of this taper is the, the hook taper, so I'll take these two feathers. Um, and then to measure, doesn't matter how long these, these are, the, these gray feathers, when I do the blend, they'll be longer than these because the feathers shape differently. What matters is how long the base is. So I'll flare them out like that where I can get a good idea of how long they are. And then I'll take my hook and just use the hook as a gauge and put it right there and I want it to be slightly longer than the hook bend and if you see it goes past the hook bend so that's the right size feather. Now all I need to do is match it to the blend. Now this is the part where you know um, you want to go ahead and straighten out the rest of your feathers so you can match the taper. and make sure that the taper is there. So in other words, this should be slightly longer than it is. This should be slightly longer than that. And it is. And then we have the taper that we need with the base color. Um, so now we come back with the blend color and we just kind of start uh, at the bottom and see where we get. Uh, this one may be too small. We'll go ahead and strip one out, straighten it out. And what we're trying to do is match the barb size. Now if you look, so these match size-wise. So when you lay them on top of each other, that barb size matches. So they line up, they're the same size. But when you look at the size of the feather, the gray one's a lot longer. So you're not worried about how tall the feather is, you're worried about how wide it is. 
um, and then just repeat for the rest of them, um, and you'll have your bug laid out. So, once you've gotten your hen feathers set out, um, this is enough to tie a bug. Uh, you don't have to go full dress like we're going to with the mirror view stacks, but I wanted to point out this little $10 block of foam. Um, you don't have to have it, but uh, if you're not using something like this, have like a book that you can lay on top of the feather so they don't get blow everywhere when you break your thread and cuss or whatever, get up to go get uh, something to drink and the feathers go everywhere and you don't know which ones go where. Uh, it's always really cool to, to have one of these blocks to fit those in. And the other thing that I wanted to point out is, like I was talking about, you want to line up the, the base barbs and not worry about how long the feather is. If you look at how much longer that gray feather is and that pink feather, it's, uh, that's what you're matching up. You're not matching up uh, how long the feather is. Um, so once I get all the, the hen feathers lined up, uh, the next I'm going to do is uh, the back and the body and the belly color. Uh, and I'll do those with marabou. Uh, it doesn't really matter what color marabou uh, you get um, or, or what type of marabou. Uh, what you're looking for are like these real big, uh, thick feathers. Um, and that's, that's what you want to pull out. Um, and a lot of times it'll be on these cheap little strings, just pull it out. Um, this is a, an example of a not great feather and if you look at it um, you can see that it's like kind of stringy at the tips and then gets thicker kind of in the middle uh, it's just not going to color that well um, whereas this is thick all the way to the end um, so what I'll do to prep these feathers um, and you'll make a big mess when you do it is I'll grab tip of it and then I'll run my fingers down to the very tips like that and you'll see like a bunch of it kind of isn't the same length like that and what I'll do is I'll grab those stragglers and just rip them out because I don't want taper to this I want all the the fibers to be the the same length and then you'll see like there they are all all nice and matchy matchy no no stragglers um, and if you do that um, there, there's no point in trying to you do want taper uh, to, to the marabou in other words you want the thickest piece uh, out here in the head and this will probably be the thickest piece but uh, just go ahead and pick out uh, one two three four five six pieces of marabou um, and as you taper them uh, it'll get you uh, that that gradual taper uh, that you're looking for. Um, so again, you're just grabbing it, getting rid of the stragglers, getting them down there, and then ripping them off. And you see, this is a thicker plume than this, so this will go in front of that. Does that make sense? And not every feather on here is going to be usable. So, you know, it's not like these packs cost that much. So, you know, don't don't hang on to the old feathers so that the next time you come in here, uh, you don't have to do much culling. These are all tapered out right and so you just want to get it and kind of put it in order of thickness um, it's probably the wispiest one that I got it probably needs to be the tail in front of it there you go just go ahead and put it in the stager You've got uh, your block fully loaded up. You got your your, your tail feathers. Uh, you got all your hen, and you got your belly and your back marabou. 
all loaded up, all tapered, um, so you don't have to touch your your hen saddle or your Meraby packs. You're you're done with the the prep side uh, with the feathers. And the last bit of prep is uh, you want to take your your support brush uh, on these big bugs. I like using flash blend uh, if you want a little bit of flash. If not. Uh, you can use like a finesse chenille or something like that, um, but uh, I, I think these come in enough colors uh, that kind of match what you're wanting to do. Um, one one brush will, will be plenty for the fly, um, and I like to pre-taper the brush. I don't do any trimming once it's on the shank on these feather changers. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll cut it into four sections. Uh, just take your old ratty pair of scissors, and cut it into four sections. The best thing to get is like a really long pair of scissors. Uh, and I'll just take it and I want about a quarter inch brush to work with. And I'll just trim the brush. Um, so, first thing we'll do is go ahead and put in that first 10 millimeter in the, uh, in the vise. Uh, we're using the, the old style flyman shanks. We're going to start with a 10. Uh, we always start with the smallest and we want the, uh, the fly to get progressively bigger in the segments. That helps with the swimming motion. Um, one reason that we want to use a, um, a 10 millimeter shank instead of a tail shank is we're going to use um, kind of the, uh, the rooster saddle and you want to create a, a platform where that can rest flat against and if you use a tail shank it's just going to roll. So uh, when I put in these shanks uh, for the tail I'll get a little bit of uh, brushable super glue. Um, and I'll put it all the way back on the shank. And what that lets me do is uh, just kind of climb the thread back up the shank uh, without building up a lot of mass, because uh, I want that to be flat. Um, and what I'll do is uh, I, I like uh, very little bulk on my flies, so the majority of the thread that we'll use for um, the, the, the bug is gonna be uh, UTC 140. Um, I, I don't like GSP for the for anything but deer here, um, so this is what I use because it doesn't build up a lot of bulk. Alright, so, all right, so what that super glue lets you do, and you just want to kind of go loosely back up here um, and then tighten it back down, but it lets you come all the way back and close that loop um, without uh, building like this big ass thread base. You don't want that. Um, and then uh, if you're using Rooster, it's a little, it's a little thin, so I, I like to use uh, four feathers if you're using like. Uh, hen cape or something like that you can get by with uh, using less but I, uh, I like to tie them in uh, two at a time it seems to be just kind of easier than putting them in uh, one by one uh, less praying hands. yeah just like praying hands um, like a lot of people will tell you, you splay them out like this uh, I like them together it's a, we call it a knife tail um, if you're there's a million different tails you can use, but uh, on these little bugs, uh, especially uh, like these stall bugs um, that will kind of show profile, I feel like the uh, praying hands or the, the knife tail is uh, gonna kick a little bit more. So that's what we want. Um, and I will just line up the tips of the feather on the shank and tie down to about right there. Looks good on that side. Match up the other side. Transfer hands. Get it all wrapped on. There you go. 
Um, there we go. That's a decent looking tail. Um, we're doing a, a shad imitation. Uh, their tails are kind of black. We've got a little bit of gray on them, so that's a pretty good imitation. Um, you don't need any support uh, on these first shanks, and a lot of times uh, I'll hear people that are starting out tying uh, on these little shanks. There's like not enough room. Um, uh, you got plenty of room, uh, more than enough. And uh, when you are wrapping these feathers, especially starting out with the, the smaller feathers, you don't have a lot of runway, so you're not going to get a whole lot of, of palmers out of uh, a feather this size, so you want to go all the way to the tip. Um, grab them like that, um, and wet, wet the feather, get it, um, get it back and looking like that and uh, there is uh, these feathers are convex on one side and concave on the other you want the, uh, the convex side to be on top and then you just tie down that little tab a couple of wraps uh, well, tie it off and then snip that little nub Push. Now, with, uh, with these feathers, there's a million different ways to do it. Um, what I like to do um, is just kind of preen them out to the side, get them all proud and mixed in. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll get my fingers a little bit wet, just a little bit, um, and I will twist my fingers back and forth. Um, and what that'll do is it'll kind of lock in the angle um, where I'm not having to constantly peel back the feathers so that they don't wrap over themselves and if you can see kind of a pinch and roll kind of a pinch and roll right um, and once you get that first wrap on um, they are not going to um, want to go any other direction than the way they're supposed to go and like I was saying you don't have a whole lot of runway there um, which is okay um, and then tie it off all right two wraps three wraps at, at most, um, and you've got that all palmered on. Um, after I close it off, I grab the stems, come back over three times, and then I'll rip the stems off. All right, now the tricky bit, the mirror bit. Um, so I'll grab uh, the top color, and on this, you want your hands pretty wet. Um, just make that a tube. All right, you don't want a whole lot of other stuff and again uh, this marabou has a convex side and a concave side uh, you don't want it sitting on the shank coming up like this you want it sitting like that so orient the feather that way um, and then what I'll do is get that hen a little bit wet where I can see the end tips and line up that marabou uh, right where it hits the tips and then transfer hands, and I'll keep it slightly on my side uh, of the shank because when I come over with the thread twice, it, it'll kind of move that marabou over to the top of the shank um, where it should be when it's done. And then after that, I'll come underneath the marabou and what I'm trying to do is, is avoid bulk at this point, which is really easy to do. Um, and to get that really snipped off, I'll twist the marabou until it's tight like a rope like that. And I'll take the thinnest damn scissors I can find, come all the way down and get it at the tip. Um, and that way there's not a whole lot of butts. Um, and then one, two, three, and it's, it's tied down and it's pretty small little thread head dam. Now flip it up on the other side um, and do the same with your, your white marabou. For the belly. And I'm 
just matching up the barbs on the hen. Putting one, two loose wraps, and when I tighten down, I put that marabou on my side, and I'll just kind of shift it over with my fingers. And there, it's perfectly centered. I'll go ahead and get up underneath it, one, two, and then I've got sharp scissors, boom. And then just tie down those butts, make a clean thread head. There, we're done. Whip finish. Yeah, I'll put another one in. Shell bass have sharp teeth, so they they get in there. All right, now I'm gonna go on a bit of a rant. Um, I hate UV resin. I'm allergic to it. But um, even if I wasn't, I wouldn't be using it because it's not durable, worth a shit. Uh, you want some flex in it. To seal these thread heads um, it's a lot more durable um, and just a little dab will do you and it'll soak up in there um, so just a, a touch there you go and we're done uh, we'll put in another 10 No, I just got some old lines. And there you can kind of see the hen in between the, the back and the belly of the marabou. So we're starting to see the color scheme. And if you notice, I'm grabbing these shanks way back on that shank, uh, on that closed loop. Um, that just helps me have the rest of that shank uh, that I can see and get a good grip on. All right, so this time I'm not gonna go all the way back over that loop because uh, I don't need to, um, but I'll go ahead and take the smallest uh, little brush section that we have, get rid of some of those hairs where I can get down to the wire, um, and then I will tie down the wire. Now, on these, these flies, like you don't need a lot of support. Um, I don't put a lot of brush in this, and this brush is pretty, pretty stiff and thick, so uh, a little dab will do you. Um, what I'll do is uh, I'll increase the size of the brush as I go, as well as I will increase the density, but on this back one, I'm only gonna do one wrap. Um, so I'm starting at the top, and I will wrap it around once concentrically, I'm not moving it forward. Um, and then I'll grab it on the other side, put another one over, and then bring back all those fibers. And then I will snip it, but not all the way flush. I'll leave like a tiny little tag in, uh, and that tag in will cut the absolute dog crap out of you. It's really sharp. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll just get my scissors and run that tag in back so that when you touch it, you're not getting stabbed. Um, so that's all the support, just that little bitty one wrap of, of the brush. Um, then I'll go to my, my second hen, same as the first. Uh, you wanna grab it right there at the top. Grab it right there at the top where you're getting as much runway as you can. Um, and then just a little bit wet, preen it back, preen it back like that. Um, and then you can see it, it looks like that. Put that tab in right where you want it. Two, three, four, five. Got the stump. We 
you see how those barbs are lined up, you know what I mean? It's like, just kind of pinch and twist. And if you set that angle, you're not really fighting the fibers as you go forward. Usually looking for about three wraps? Um, no, I, I you know, try to go all the way to the eye. Uh, and you know, part of that's like building the taper in when we're prepping it ahead of time. Um, like some of these feathers are going to have longer runways than the others, um, and that just is a function of doing the prep, so you don't have to do it later or think about it. So two locked in. Then I'll take the butts. Um, two, three, four, five. Lock it in. Uh, don't need a lot of thread to lock this shit in. Um, and then I'll just pull the stems off and go right back to the mirror wheel, wet this back a little bit so it's easier for me to see where the fibers end. I'll get my back mirror wheel. Take my first 15, go into a bigger shank. Uh, um, the only difference between here and the hook shank is um, I'll do two wraps of uh, the quarter inch brush on this and then I'll move to like that half inch brush and do three wraps on the, the, the other shank and then we'll move to the hook. So I always like when I'm doing more than one wrap, uh, I like having the, the back wrap, I'll do one wrap on itself and then I'll progress the, the brush forward uh, just to give it a little bit more length since we're going onto a bigger shank. So, special tool. If you can see, I've got like more butts than I want kind of crowding in that eye. Now you can do this and you can like take a lighter to a bodkin and burn it out, but if you have like a $20 cauterizing tool, um, that's helpful. You don't want to touch um, the thread with it, but just get a little bit of that eye uncrowded. Yeah, already on the side. Stay here. Good thing I'll go. Last 15. So, what do we have so far in America? Yeah, so we have. Uh, 10, 10, 15, and we're going to do another 15 and then the hook. So we're, we're halfway done with the butt. Alright, so go ahead and take your, your tail out of the vise, put it to the side. 
put your hook in the vise. Um, so again, this is a, the Arix uh, XO774. Um, it's kind of a thicker wire gauge than their NS172. Um, I like these a lot, um, but on these bugs, because it is a thicker gauge wire and because that hook gap is so big, um, it, it'll kind of flop over to the side, so we're going to keel it too. Um, if you want to tie this bug uh, without as much weight, you can go to the lighter gauge uh, size too, um, but don't give those big fish the beans because it will it will bend out that hook. Um, and go ahead and put down uh, some brushable on the shank. Just give it something to bite to. Um, and then uh, when you're making your, your thread base on this, you want it to be a rough thread base, so you don't want it to be just like one big smooth thing. You just want to kind of come back to the bend and then make that crisscross pattern where there's like kind of rough on the top. Um, and then you want to take a 15 millimeter shank and go ahead and get your fingernail underneath there and like kind of bend it out like that and make sure that it's straight. You can see it's kind of bent. Um, I've got, uh, you can do it with a pair of scissors. Just kind of make sure that shank's lined up um, instead of flopping one side or the other. And then come in and line it up. Now, on this 15 millimeter shank, you are going to get that eye right there and it's going to make this big fat spot. So, just if you're using over 140, uh, it sucks to be you because it's going to be really difficult to do. So, you like to use keep that eye in there to give it purchase, to give it bite? Yep. And what you're wanting to do is tie down the shank um, on the bottom side pretty well and then I will come up with a little bit more brushable and just kind of hit the sides get it good and secure in there um, now there's sharp parts to this so where that shank returns like right there, that's going to be a sharp spot. So when you're cranking down, if you crank down on there, you will pop your thread. Uh, so I come in there with like a loose wrap or two and then cover up that sharp spot. All right, so once you've cranked it down, you got it good and secure and glued in, then you come with your, your tail, slide it over the shank, and that's your connection point now um, is when we're going to go ahead and add the bead um, there's a little trickery to this uh, but you go ahead and get the bead and slip it over the shank and put it all the way back down uh, back here and when you come back around and just kind of press that shank back down And broke, the th and broke the thread, and broke the thread, but that's okay, we can break it there. Okay, so once you've got that return all the way down on the shank, flat up against it, and you've secured this part of it, then I'm gonna take that bead and move it all the way up and come around the back side of that bead and lock it in. Now you can go ahead and do a little bit more glue to make sure it soaks into those, those wraps. So it's kind of belly scratcher style, but not really. Um, again, it's because I don't want a lot of bulk. And if you're gonna do belly scratcher and put that wire in, it's just gonna add a little bit more bulk you don't want that so that's like a really clean way to, to add that keel 
and because the bead is is kind of offset, uh, you, you have the center of gravity lower uh, with the same amount of weight. Um, so uh, that's kind of how we arrived at that size for this bug um, without giving it a jig in action or kind of a broke back action. What size bead are you using on there? Uh, this is a 3.8 millimeter bead. Uh, you could go to a four if you can't find those, uh, but I think that they have like 3.2, 3.8, uh, four and five millimeter. Uh, but for this size, you want to use 3.8, works perfect. I'm going to go ahead and tie in your brush. Um, you do not need the brush behind the bead at all. Um, it's just going to add bulk for no reason. All right, now uh, one quick little tip going back to uh, the front of this thing and how bulky it is. Um, if you don't have a thread base down on that shank eye, your uh, thread is going to kind of roll and flop all over that. So I try to just put down a little bit of glue and that way I can put down a tiny little bit of thread just so everything's got a little bit of grip to it when I'm trying to put a feather down right there. Um, you're wrapping it around that shank it's it's actually wider so you really don't need that many wraps of support because it's already a little bit long All right, so in this one, I'm not gonna fold back the, the stems um, just because it's um, it's already like a little bit uh, crowded in there. Um, I'm just gonna cut them flush. Now on this part, you are gonna get fish teeth all in here, right? And like, if you've got trout or, you know, shoal bass have sharper teeth than other bass, they're gonna get in there. Uh, you just wanna make sure that you're like wrapping back over those stems because if a tooth gets into that stem that you palmered on there, it's just gonna pop that feather off and nothing is gonna piss you off more than spending this much time on a fly and, and breaking it in the middle. and pop in uh, your 20 millimeter shank.
get going now. On this one, because I just got on the hook, I'll go ahead and tighten it up because I do not want this to slip. Now everybody's got a different way of doing these eyes, so I'll just show you how I do it. An eye towards not having a bulky fly. Um, I'm just putting out a rough thread base. You can see kind of the gaps in between the the wraps that I did. Um, and if you get a little bit too much glue in there, you can just kind of come in with one of your feather stems and get it out. Again, come back and move back up here to where I want the eyes to be. Now, uh, on the eyes, what I'll do is I'll measure them. Uh, I want them to be pupil touching uh, the, the back of the eyelet, and then I will move my thread back to the middle of the eyes, put one, two wraps on it, and let it come around just like that. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll keep it kind of at a diagonal like that, if you can see, and I'll wrap it one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and it's good and locked to the side. And then what I'll do is I'll twist it and then come back around the other side. One, two, three, four, five, six, nine. All right, so now it's straight. I've got the thread pulling it both ways, so it's fairly solid. But then the finishing move is uh, do a series of crisscross and then come under the shank, kind of pulling all that together. All right, that's as bulky as I want that to be. Um, I'll come in with uh, the, the full size one inch brush. And you'll, the first time you tie one of these, you will continually poke yourself. So just be aware that that, that hook's right there. About four wraps is all you need. feathers on this one so doubling the amount of feathers on the last one yep uh, and then three three on the um, on the hook you want to make sure these are good and wrapped in because uh, the teeth will get in these too And, and twisting your fingers to set the angle really helps when you're trying to tie in that many feathers at the same time. You just like bring some Yeah. these feathers you want to crowd it into those eyes. You do not want a gap in between those eyes and that feather. And I'll grab those stems and they'll kind of come around the contour of those eyes. If you can see the thread path that I'm taking, I'm moving that thread 
up and down on the eyes to, to not wrap down those feathers. And then, let's uh, get him in. Really sharp scissor, cut them flush. And kind of brush that out. Again, you can put them on where they're like curved out, but I, I like to put them in curved in. Uh, this side of the feather is a little bit more dull than this side, so I just like it to look like the tail. Matchy, matchy. All right, uh, one last thing before we go and switch to the GSP. Um, if you look at where this shank is closed, you got like a sharp point right there. And when you're tying off the deer here and you're really cranking down on that GSP, your GSP is gonna find that and cut itself. Uh, so I like to build up just a couple of loose wraps over it just to kind of fill that in before I switch. And that, that will be a very, the, the most frustrating place for you to break your thread on this fly. So now we're going to move to the deer hair head. Um, I, yeah, so on a deer hair head, um, you can use body hair. Um, I find that the, uh, the belly hair, um, you're going to get uh, more vivid colors uh, as well as a lot more durability in the fly. Uh, I feel like a lot of the body hair um, is a little bit more fragile. The, the fibers break a little bit easier. And when those, those fish are coming up and, and really gnawing on that hair because they're hooked one shank behind, they're kind of rubbing all up against it and everything like that, you'll, you'll get a lot of broken hairs. Uh, like if you look at the back of this head, you get, you're getting some of that collar is, is already kind of split. Um, and you have like some of those hairs just kind of getting chewed up because uh, I used body hair uh, for some of that head. Uh, so we're going to use uh, all belly hair. Um, get it from a number of places. But best advice I can give to you is like go to the shop uh, in person and feel through the bag. Um, this is what I would consider really, really, really good hair. Um, it's thick like a tree and pretty long. Um, this is, uh, if you can see, okay here, uh, but you can see how, how thin that is compared to it. Uh, so I, I like the thickest stuff that I can get my hands on. Um, so uh, with deer hair, you're going to want to use uh, GSP. You can use GSP 100. Um, I find that I cut the deer hair with it. Um, it it's like too thin. Uh, and I've talked a lot about not wanting to have bulk. This is a lot of bulk. Um, 
But uh, the other thing that I'll do differently is, if you see, I've been using a, a bobbin with a ceramic tip for the 140. That's great because it doesn't score very bad um, on, and, and snap your thread. But on this one, uh, you're, I'm, I'm going to use a, a steel tip. Um, and uh, in the past, you see me uh, use super glue uh, to, to kind of get a base down. Don't do that on deer here because it, when it sets, it sets so hot that it'll kind of mess up the fibers of the deer here and make it way less durable. Um, so I will put down a little bit of fleximate because uh, it doesn't it doesn't burn in real hot, um, just to give that GSP something to grab onto. Uh, the other thing to know about GSP is it doesn't stretch, um, so it's it's a little bit harder to lock it on. Uh, so that's the other reason that we use that. Um, and so just a little bit uh, to get it onto the shank. And I'll go ahead and cut it flush. Because um, it'll bulk up on you real quick. Alright. Now the first thing that we're going to do is uh, take your hair packer. Um, this is the kind that I use. Uh, it swings open, but it has a little window so I can see the tips are lined up. You can use um, one of these. This is a more traditional way. Pack it in, pull it out, pull the tips out. Uh, but I, I like using one of these. It's a little bit easier to kind of see where you are. What I want to do is find uh, a piece of the hair that doesn't have like a bunch of roll or cowlicks in the hair. It'll, it'll all come out once you get it wet. But, uh, I want to find a pretty good clump uh, for the collar. I always pull off more than what I'll actually need. Uh, but what I'll do is I'll try to get in there and pull it out straight where um, when I'm putting tension on it, all that, that hair is pretty, pretty straight in there because I want all that length uh, is really important to me. Um, so what I'll do is I'll get down as low as I can on the skin of the, of the, uh, the hair. Gosh. And get out uh, a pretty big clump. Um, and then uh, kind of clean out some of the junk that just automatically fall out. Um, but then I'm wanting the longest hair. Um, so what I'm doing is, is kind of grabbing it by the, by the tips and rolling it in my hand. And when I do that, a lot of the shorter fibers are just going to come out. Um, and then this doesn't have a lot of the, the under fur. Um, if the deer's killed late in season, uh, it'll have a lot of like fuzzy dubbing stuff in it and that'll keep your hair from acting the way that it wants to. It'll also kind of more likely to, to cut your thread. Um, and then just come in with a comb. Uh, I like plastic combs because they don't have a ton of static, but a little bit of static's good to get that junk out. And I'll just uh, kind of comb through and uh, make sure I get all that under fur. This doesn't really have any under fur, but you want to make a good practice of that anyway. Put in your hair stacker. Line your tips. And if you look in the window, you can kind of see you're getting where you want to be. Um, go ahead and take those out. Tips line. And See all the tips are perfectly lined. And what I want to do is I want to kind of gauge how long I want that to be. Um, and this is just kind of how I do it. Um, but when you're practicing with deer here, uh, the biggest skill set is transferring the material from one hand to the other without kind of losing your place. Um, but I have it started out here. Um, when I lay it down on the shank, I want to lay it down with my left hand so that my right hand can control the thread. Um, but I want to see how long I want it to be. And I want it to match exactly where that marabou and those hen feathers are. So I know that that's where I want to grab it. 
and then I'll cut it pretty flush uh, on the butts. Um, just one big flush kind of mass and then I'll come in and lay that directly on top of the shank like a skyscraper. You can see it's not on the side too much or anything like that. I'll spin my thread that way uh, to kind of make it a little bit more tubular and then I'll put one loose wrap and kind of pull down and then a second loose wrap and then pull it all the way down uh, straight down uh, and let go um, and that'll kind of give me an idea of is my length right and everything like that if it is what I'll do is push down on the thumb and I'll spread it over the top and come in one two three and like lock in my thread now these butts are a little bit longer than i want them to be so i will go ahead and kind of get those proud come in with a sharp pair of scissors and let me kind of cut those down flush or as flush as i can get them and the reason I want to do that is I want to clear out uh, the area around the eye um, so that the hair can get back in there. Tapered so they're, they're thinner at the tip and they're thicker up here and I want the, the thicker part of the hair to be up against the collar for when I'm trimming it. Uh, it's like easier for me to tell what's uh, you know, supposed to be a stack versus what's supposed to be a collar. So I'll go ahead and kind of transfer hands like that. Um, these are all pretty lined up. Uh, if you really wanted to be anal about it, you can put it back in the stacker to really line those up. Uh, but after I've got them lined up in the way that I want them, uh, I'll go in and I will chop the, the finer points off kind of flush and I will come in and I'll find the middle of the bundle okay. and I'll just put it a little bit shorter than the collar again to help me when I'm trimming it not much um, and spin my thread again and come over once behind the eyes give it a little bit of pull a second time let go while I have tension on it and I'll put my fingers up underneath the eye like right there and just cinch down but when I'm cinching down if you see the thread is kind of locked into the back of that eye and I want to I want to pull that hair into the eye um, and I'll do that by pulling forward with the bobbin and that hair will flare up there just like that um, and then I want to come back roughly through the middle of the hair that I just put on uh, once and really lock it in see it's all kind of poofed out um, now uh, the bottom stack Let's see is this hair good enough yeah good grief that's some good hair all right, now you don't need a bunch for the, the bottom color. Um, and this is the, the trickiest part of the head. So you don't need a lot of hair for the bottom comparatively. You can see it's just there for decoration. It's not uh, adding keel or anything like that. And if you look closely at, um, this has a lot of under fur in the, uh, in the, uh, in the hair. Um, and I'll kind of show you what that looks like. Um, see all the, it looks almost like dubbing. Um, so this is a deer that was killed late in season. Uh, you just want to get as much of that under fur out of there as you possibly can. And this has got a lot, but it's really good guard here. Just 
Again, I want the buds to be kind of towards the back so that the thicker ones are or the thicker part of the head. Cut the tips flush. Uh, doesn't really matter because really you're going to get rid of almost all of this. This is a tricky move, but I want the thread kind of locked in behind the eyes, right? And kind of get the, the vise sideways. And I'll come in here and I want to pinch that down where it's just like that. And then come up over the eyes through that here, through that path over the top that we already took and just wiggle my thread so it don't trap a bunch. And come through the eyes and really crank it down. And that's all that I'm putting in on the side. And then this is the tricky move. Um, and people have tried to show me how to do this on camera a million times, but uh, when I'm working around the lead eye, I'll move that thread up over the eye. I'm using the eye to, to apply pressure. And then I'm bringing the thread back in front. You see the thread path? And then I'm really tightening it down and I'm trying to get as much of the hair to not be trapped as possible. Um, you're, you're gonna trap one or two. Then I'll come up on that shank. And then back over itself to lock it in. Essentially parting it. Yep. But that move uh, coming back over the eye um, is the best way that I've found to work around uh, lead eye heads. Um, and once you figure out that move, it's it's pretty easy. Now I'm walking through them, somebody through it sucks. Um, all right, so then you take your last uh, top color uh, stack. And you're about the same as you had on the on the bottom. You don't need a bunch. And then I don't even bother to, to trim the, the butts off on this. It just kind of helps to have all the length. Um, then what I'll do is I'll keep the fly kind of sideways like I had it. And I will get this bobbin and this thread. I'll get the tip of the bobbin uh, up into the hair where it's shorter than the hair. Um, and I will come in with this stack again, having the thicker parts of the butts closer to the back. Yeah, you're gonna, this is like, you're not gonna see it even if you're on it. Um, I will come in and grab it and it's gonna hang at an angle like that, right? And I'm gonna come in with this. I'm gonna get one wrap over it pinch it, another loose wrap, and then come over, and then I've got that held, right? Um, and I wanna come in with my thumb and, and spread it all around the shank, where I'm not really spinning it, but it is gonna spin. Um, and I'll find that eye, and I'll just pull down. And all that hair should be fairly evenly distributed. Um, in that front and now I can barely see the eye. Take a half inch tool, try to get that eye a little bit more visible and then I'll just try to snake my thread around the top of, of that tool um, where I can get that thread over the eye. There we go. And if you've got a bigger head, you can come in here and whip finish by hand, but uh, more than likely you're gonna come in here with a half hitch tool um, and just get it in there as much as possible. So 
With these razors, um, you can buy these at the local pharmacy. They come in a little pack. Um, but uh, you want a, a double-edged razor, and the reason you do is you want it to be a little bit flexible um, so that you can create. You want it to be a little bit flexible so you can create shapes with it with your hands. Um, some people have uh, a fear of these razor blades, and they want to use a tool to create that angle that they want. Um, it's an unfounded fear um, and when you're pushing against the hair um, it's not going to be as even of a, of a cut because some of the hairs are going to lay back and then get cut uh, versus if you draw like a knife uh, it's going to give you a much smoother cut. Um, so while it's still in the vise and I do a lot of this trimming outside of the vise uh, I'll come in and I'll find that eye and I'll put the the blade right up against it and just go straight up. And just create a, a flat face. Um, if you can see, it's like kind of flat. And then I can see the, the eyes in here. And what I want to do is just make a, a gradual cut back. Now, because I don't want to get into that marabou and that hen, I'm not going to go all the way back when I'm cutting. I'm going to leave some of these butts. I'm going to come and get those later. Um, I'm just looking to set the line of how far I want to go back. Now, on this fly, that white is just there as a decoration. I don't need it to, to add profile or bulk to the fly, so I'm going to get it pretty close to the the lead eyes on the bottom that flat take your time you can start to see that the eyes are right there um, and then what I want to do is just kind of take take the razor like this um, and I want to start drawing it like a knife um, and what I'm trying to do is I'm not trying to tie like a, a sex dungeon head where it's really big and wide. Um, I'm trying to just add keel and profile. Uh, that's the only purpose of the head other than the weed guard part of it. So what I'll start to do is I will start contouring straight down. You can see that cut that I'm making. Um, and I just want to find the eyes and use the eyes as a guide. Make a flat cut. You can see that, that cut's kind of flat up against the side. Um, and I'll do the same. And you can see it's just kind of putting that shape on it where it's it's just kind of boxy. Um, and it looks ridiculous right now. Um, but then um, after I kind of get that basic shape, I will come straight up. And because I've already shaved the side profile, it's really just the top that I'm trying to set the profile with. Um, and you don't want to get it too fine uh, while it's in the vise because it's going to be like a little wacky. Um, but you just want to come up and over and, and get that, that top profile. That point, it's kind of profiled to the point that I wanted in the vise, a little rough. Um, but I can see the eyes, I can see the basic shape, and I'm going to take it out of the body. Alright, so when we tied in uh, the, the belly of the deer here, I made it a point to tie in the butts a little bit shorter than the hen, so the hen's a little bit longer. And what that allows you to do is come in and grab the hen, 
um, and pull it out of the way where you can see that the the butts are just kind of hanging out up here and the hens all kind of held back. Um, that lets me get in here and really cut that flush without cutting into the hen. And if you're trimming this, like you can see it kind of creates a bump right where I trimmed it, uh, where it's kind of sticking out of where I had shaved it. That's what you want and that's why you're, you're doing that trim right now because if you trimmed it real close and then try to do it, that bump's not going to be there and the head's going to look a little bit more separate than it should. Um, so I've got the the butt's trimmed pretty close. The other reason I want to do that is the further back the hair is towards the hook, the less gap there is for a bass's mouth to get back there and grab it. Um, and you want the full amount. Um, so you don't want this all coming back. Um, so that line we made on the belly, you can go ahead and kind of follow that line up um, on the back side. And you definitely want to do this now and not later. So there we have kind of a, a separate head and a collar. Um, got a big gap in there and we'll just trim it down to the top of the gap and we'll be good. All right, and this is where I start to really wear into that razor blade. So that eye is still fairly buried in there and I want to clear that eye out. So I'll come straight down and from the bottom and find that total eye. Just really shaving down. Let me see, now I can see the eye. I'm gonna come back from the top, do the same thing. And this really helps, you want it to push a lot of water. Um, one of the things that really makes this swim is is that head uh, does not have water passing through it. It's just pushing water and it's kind of like a knuckleball. Um, so it's it's real unpredictable where that head's going to float. Um, but um, that is uh, pretty much your, your finished bug. Um, you can sit here and mess with the hair for hours, but that's that's kind of where you want to end up um, as far as uh, the finished bug goes. Um, it's about five inch bug um, and that that gap that we got into the hair uh, by making those cuts um, really gave it um, you know about a finger's worth of uh, hook gap so if you've got a bass with a maxilla uh, bigger than that finger, you got problem, but uh, I have not run into a bass that big. Um, so it's gonna get plenty of hook gap to get in there and get um, all kinds of big critters. Um, but that's it, it's gonna swim through um, all kinds of different structure, no problem. Um, you can stall it out, um, it's going to, um, all real great. Fish is going to be able to expect it, um, and and they will sit there, look at it, and uh, eat it. And now we have like half a damn deer up here.